I bet you won't argue with this. Life can be intense right now. This podcast, as the title suggests, is about the exercise intensity for optimal aging for women in menopause. It's not just regurgitating position statements and guidelines written inclusive of all ages and both genders. It takes into account your unique journey, as well as the collective needs of women in menopause, knowing the trend of hormones during perimenopause to postmenopause, that transition and beyond. Before we dive in, I'm Deborah Atkinson, and I've been a full-time fitness professional for 37 years, teaching, writing, speaking, lecturing in the Department of Kinesiology at Iowa State University, Go Cyclones, and training other fitness instructors and trainers for nearly three decades. I've been in the private sector, the academia uh, arena, and a consultant and a advisor for fitness industry agencies, and I bring you the evidence-based science of menopause and exercise that helped grow a community of now over 250,000 women, Flipping 50. I'm the creator of the Flipping 50 Fitness Specialist, supporting trainers and fitness instructors in creating a comeback strong campaign for the fitness industry that isn't about more choices but about better ones for you and for them. The episode sponsor is Stronger, my 12-week strength training program designed for women in menopause and the Flipping 50 Advanced Specialist for Fitness Professionals. I'll put links to both in the show notes and be sure to visit the website if you need a strength training program proven to work for women in menopause based on science where the subjects are only, you guessed it, women in menopause. If you're a fitness professional who needs better solutions for her clients or you're a woman in menopause yourself who knows the strength training program you're doing or not doing is not working right now, these are for you. Okay, lady, you are making history. Did you know? You're part of the first generation of adults who've been exercising the majority of your adult life. You influence 85% of all buying decisions in your house. That's true of women of any age, but I think we can all agree that it's more influential, more true, the older you get. So in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, it dials up, not down, because you influence not only your household, You influence three generations of household. I'm sure I don't have to paint you that picture, but bear with me. We're talking about your kids or your young adult kids in their own homes now, or those who will be talking about you, yours, your partner, but also your peers, your colleagues. I mean, who do you ask if you need a dentist, you need a doctor, you need a gym, or you need a trainer? Exactly. And then your parents and your in-laws. What you learned when you begin to exercise all those years ago is not what will serve you now. You did not have the same hormones you had, which together with your lifestyle habits influenced the body composition and metabolism you have right now. Maybe it didn't work out all that way well for you. Number two, science has had 40 years to prove itself wrong or improve And using what worked then, even for a 20-year-old, wouldn't be the optimal way to exercise right now. We do not live in the same world or have the same toxins or stressors. So those are three reasons. Quick recap of why what you learned once, if you're still trying to do that, won't work today. You don't have the same hormones you used to have. Science has marched on. There is better science and all layers of science are right now the best information we have at the moment. But that science is the foundation for, okay, wait, let's take another look. That's what researchers do. 
doesn't mean it was wrong at the time. It just means we now know so much better. And last, we don't live in the same world. We don't have the same toxins. We don't have the same food quality or the same stressors. Okay. What you learn from any living human with a personal computer who chooses to post online or author their own self-published book, blog, or create videos may not be based on science about women just like you. So it's very easy. You know, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, right? Because you read it in the Times. It must be true. But if you read it online, it does not make it true. There are sites that call themselves by names that suggest to you, oh, this is scientific basis. No, like something like Scientific Daily or Science Daily. The title implies, okay, it's totally science. It's totally somebody's interpretation of science. And so we've got to, all of this, be extremely careful. And I, when I say that, Bring that on myself. I'm not saying don't scrutinize me. You'll find where in blogs or podcasts I'm referencing science. I'm sharing the science. Okay, here's the thing. So all of those PC holders, people with an iPhone who can post anything, anytime, you've got to wonder, But I'm asking you, can Instagram influencers in their 20s and 30s or 40s, 50s, 60s inspire you? Maybe, you tell me. Can they give you the science of how to exercise optimally in your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, your 70s? It's less likely. And here's why I say that. Because I'm disappointed every day. Some of the things that are posted are backwards. They are based on everything we've just talked about, information that was released 20, 30, 40 years ago, but is no longer holding up true for women in menopause. The question is, is it about you or about them when those influencers are sharing? Even early 40-something female trainers who maybe are not yet aware of the hormonal differences during menopause for exercise that influence and are influenced by exercise. In other words, will fail you. Why? Well, because often those women are working their way through it and they may not yet be affected. I can take myself as an example. So I was 49 when I quit my job, safety, security, all of that. I wasn't having signs and symptoms yet of menopause, not really. So all through my 40s, I had no idea what are people talking about and really thought I must be immune because I've exercised my whole life and never really had that. And I've had a few trainers and fitness instructors comment, yes, you know, like so true. I've been exercising my whole life. Menopause was no big deal. And I'm just, okay nodding and acknowledgement. And that may be true. They may be the anomaly and very lucky, but at some point it doesn't mean they're out of the woods yet. So many women can experience symptoms post-menopause that they never had going through or in perimenopause. Every woman's journey is different. So unless or until fitness instructors begin to experience or really truly care enough about you as the customer, the client, the end user of their program, they may not be catering to you. Maybe they've spent years training women 40 and beyond. That may be different. They then may have the wake up call. Okay. I need to do something differently here. Fitness professionals though, are often first motivated to become active themselves because they want to look, feel, or perform in a certain way themselves which is hardly personal training. If they're only sharing what is working at the moment for them, but the way of one is not the way of masses. So as soon as a fitness instructor begins talking about perimenopause or menopause because she's in it or identifies that this is a ready to buy market, 
there you have it, right? It's a motivating factor for a lot of trainers right now because they know that you're vulnerable. You're seeking information and whether or not it's right is what you have to be the judge of. There's only one way for one person, right? Or is that true? There may be different ways for one person, but they may be using a way that is working currently. However, that one way won't be the way for many. There's no one way for the masses. There's a blueprint. No two women, for instance, experience the same menopause. Some symptoms are common among women, yet some women experience some of the 34 symptoms others never even know exist. Let's talk deeper about the exercise specifically, HIT and menopause. So HIT standing for high intensity interval training. While HIT can definitely produce result, too much of it, without proper recovery can lead to overtraining. Too much, by the way, is far less than you think it is. 45 minutes a week seems scientifically to be the point where there's a tipping point after which injury rates climb pretty dramatically, especially a concern for women in midlife because there is already a higher arc in injury rates. Now, I scientifically cannot give you a a study that will say that. What I can give you is 37 years of working with primarily the entire time. So during my, my career, I've worked with high school athletes. I've worked with uh, world-class Ironman triathletes with age group triathletes and everyday CPAs, lawyers, realtors, high, powerful women, entrepreneurs who want to get fit. However, it's really important to consider the fact that we need all kinds of metabolic training and that when we go high intensity, more often injury rates climb dramatically, but never more than for women at midlife. And my basis of experience has seen that throughout my career, talking to other, both fitness professionals, personal trainers, fitness instructors, but also to physical therapists. This seems to be across the board, very true for them as well. There's a higher rate of, especially itis, which is chronic injuries, plantar fasciitis, tendonitis, at the elbow, at the shoulder, uh, at the wrist, we're talking carpal tunnel syndrome, hip bursitis. Those injuries are all chronic. They didn't come on immediately. In fact, I'll talk to you a little bit about this at the end, where often you start an exercise program where people can, and an injury comes to their attention. It's really easy to blame why I started an exercise program and got hurt. That injury was there. It was already born. What happened is the exercise that you intentionally began to do made you aware of it, which can be a good thing. You reach a tipping point faster so that you can stop, do something about it and fix it before it stops you completely in your tracks. More on that at the end. Okay. So we know hit at about 45 minutes or less a week. So we're talking split between two or three sessions potentially. And for that reason, if hit is good, a little bit of it, but more is an injury, it's important to include other types of metabolic conditioning in your workout. So what's often recommended is not always best steady state training your 1980s exercise friend features a high volume of work to enhance your aerobic capacity. What's the red flag there? High volume. If you read high volume anywhere and you're a woman in midlife, run, 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 run. For women in midlife, amidst hormone fluctuation, steady state far too for too long or too often, is most likely to cause cortisol issues, adrenal issues, or dysfunction. 
Move more, yes. Take walks, but not with a must-get-in-target-heart-rate-range slant. Avoid moderate-intensity exercise for the most part. You'll also be told by some very popular brands today, even led by soon-to-be midlife women, that exercise at low intensity burns more fat. Oh my goodness. Please, 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 please. 1980 called and wants that one back. I'm going to insert a small lesson in fat burning here. So you burn fat at a very high percentage when you're doing very low intensity exercise. So I don't know what you're doing right now. I'm hoping you're going for a walk, but if you're sitting and I happen to be sitting recording this podcast, I'm burning about hundred percent fat. Guess what? If sitting was the solution or low intensity exercise was the solution, we'd all be thin easily, but that's not happening. So we burn a high percent of fat for fuel, but we burn it so slowly that it does not help you lean up or get rid of fat, which are the words that you will hear used. And they are so very sexy and seductive that you want to sign up. Where do I get that? Right. And I don't have to sweat really great. Yes. Not true. All right. Yes. You do need more movement. And for women in post menopause, that kind of low level movement, walking your dog around the block, not a go-getter dog, just a dog, is actually a big needle mover, but not at the exclusion of high-intensity interval training and of strength training. We'll talk more about what you want to do is make sure that you're aware that when you do high-intensity interval training, yes, the percent of fat you use for fuel during that 20 to 30 minutes is much lower because your body has to preference carbohydrates for fuel because it's instant energy. It's working hard. It doesn't have time while it's shunting blood with oxygen to those working muscles faster over and over to also go get fat from storage. Can't do that. So it uses carbs. However, there's always a percent of carbs and a percent of fat, maybe a percent of protein, but we'll leave that out because it's a minimal effect that you're using. But if you're burning a vastly higher amount of calories, even if it's a lower percent of fat for fuel, ultimately at the end of the workout, you'll burn more fat overall during that exercise. And then in the payback after the so-called after burn effect. So high intensity ultimately is the biggest fat burner. And for women who are in midlife, who may already be struggling with exhaustion just from their life and day or close to adrenal fatigue, doing more slogging around in low level activity is not necessarily the goal. And you want to hit it and quit it basically. So get those short little bursts in and then leave it alone. Yes, move more, but don't think more steady state exercise will help. Generally in midlife, it hurts. So let's talk burning fat. Here's what the studies show. Visceral belly fat is most influenced, positively influenced by high intensity interval training for women in menopause. Second to that for visceral belly fat, is lifting weights. So the heavier, the better. Muscles must reach temporary muscle fatigue in order to have those kinds of results when you're lifting weights. But there it is. Those are the two singular two things that if you want to impact your visceral belly fat, get up off the floor, stop doing those crunches and and sit-ups ever, please, but not even planks. That's not going to help you burn visceral belly fat. That helps strengthen the muscles underneath. Does nothing. Zero, zip, nada for the fat on top. You've got to work from a metabolic standpoint to do that. Here's the old thinking. Get moderate intensity exercise. Here's the new thinking. Get moderate amounts of low and high intensity exercise. So let's describe all the tools in your intensity arsenal. Low intensity interval training, right? So you're used to hearing hit. Well, this is lit. (laughs) Uses low to moderate intensity intervals combined with periods of active rest to improve the efficiency of your cardiorespiratory 
or respiratory system to deliver oxygen to working muscles. Now, this one is that really walking, walking around the block. And if you look at historical studies on fitness, definitely if you're going from couch to get up off the couch, you're going to low to moderate intensity intervals. In a person's life, this is going to have huge positive influence on your health, your risk of disease. And it's the biggest gap we've got to take inactive you to moving you. And then we've made a huge difference. Okay. So we're not discounting that, but you cannot stay there and continue to get results. Your body adapts. Yes, you need it. Movement is great, but you need something more. In Pete McCall's new book, Ageless Intensity, he introduces these intensity labels to you as well. So if you want to see them in writing, you can, of course, go to the show notes and I'll give you the link to that. Or look for his book. It's in on Amazon, of course, Ageless Intensity. And I interpret them all here for you with more commentary on how the influence menopause, how they influence menopause fitness and the midlife women, AKA you. <laughs> if at the time of this post, Pete's flipping 50 podcast interview with me isn't yet published, it soon will be. So watch for that. Be sure you're a listener, subscribe in iTunes. If you've got an Apple product, variable interval training. So V I T. What is that? It alternates between short and intermediate and longer periods of work to challenge your body to work efficiently for different lengths of time. So as a triathlete, this is one that I did a lot of fluctuating. So I would have interval training sometimes while I was running or biking that was say eight minutes long of higher intensity and three minutes long of low intensity to recover. And that's a probably a protocol that you're not quite as used to hearing or doing. It's tucked into one of our programs because it's also effective for using one of those three energy systems. And did you know you have three, but quite often we're doing too much of aerobic exercise, not enough of the other two. Okay. So in addition, variable intensity interval training, variable intensity interval training. So I just said first variable interval training, that's shorter, longer periods of time, the variable intensity, the V I I T alternates between periods of low and moderate and higher intensity exercise to provide a different kind of overload. For instance, an advanced interval workout for our flipping 50 members, I will include sets of high intensity with short, low intensity recovery, longer duration, high intensity intervals with moderate recovery length and long, moderate intensity intervals with short, uh, low intensity recovery. So all different kinds of variables within the same workout. And if you've done, say, a boot camp in the past, or you've used something like an app, a seconds timer, you can easily program these things for yourself. So there's variability, but the easiest way to do it, if you've got an elliptical trainer, if you've got a treadmill, it's already pre-programmed. So you can go and push the button. The only thing it doesn't know when those programs come up is, you know, it puts in a speed of its own. That doesn't necessarily mean that the fastest speed or the highest incline is where it needs to be for you. And for that reason, it's very appropriate that you program yourself or work with somebody who can do that for you. So the following is an example, and this will be in the show notes, literally laid out. It's an example of a variable interval training plus combining variable intensity interval training. So Honestly, I want to tell you that variable intensity interval training is almost present in every HIT workout that includes alternating high and low intensity intervals, since it also includes a progressive warm up. But here's how I do interval training. Literally, this is one of my workouts. So I warm up 
for about 10 minutes. And here's how I do it. I start the intervals right then. But of course, I'm not working on breathlessness during that interval, but I'm preparing my body for the workout it's about to do. So I, I choose a speed that is comfortable walking speed for me that would not be taxing. I could do it for three hours and be fine. So I start with a minute of low intensity walking. Then I alternate right then. I'll just do 30 seconds of a, a moderate intensity jog. So you may not be jogging or want high impact. You can choose to walk faster or walk at an incline if you'd prefer. And then I'll come back to a minute of low, low walking, same speed I was at before. I'll come back up to higher or moderate intensity, but I'm increasing my speed in this one by another half a mile. So I start with a jog at six miles an hour. The next interval is 6.5 miles back for a minute to that very comfortable walk. Then I go to a seven mile per hour jog, but this time I'm doing it for a minute 30. So by that five, six minute point, I'm really beginning to feel like, okay, now I'm starting to breathe harder, but I always come back to that same slow level, moderate pace. That was not taxing. Then I increase again 7.5 7.5 miles an hour, but just for a minute, come back down to the walk and I come all the way back up 7.5 again, maybe eight if I'm feeling like, okay, I'm almost ready to do my intervals. The main set is this 30 seconds of high intensity. For me, it's a run. It might be an incline for you. It might be a fast, steady pace. So my run will be at nine miles per hour. Now, nine miles per hour. I don't love, right? It's high intensity interval training. You're not supposed to love it. You're just supposed to be able to do it. And no, no. If you have to hold on to the treadmill, do not do that speed. It's not your speed. If you have to hold on to the treadmill, you shouldn't be on it. You should be doing something else. So one minute of low impact walking, but my speed I reduce. So what you want is a very high high and a very low low. So no longer am I walking that non-taxing rate I warmed up with. I'm lower than that. So I'm truly recovering completely by that minute. I repeat that eight times, maintaining it. So I'm not monitoring those or altering those. Why? Because you're working really intensely in those high intense interval training. Your, Your brain doesn't need to also think. So last, I cool down. I'll do two minutes at 3.5, so making it very, very comfortable. And then I'll do eight more minutes at the four, which is back to my starting level, kind of a non-taxing recovery level. That's it. Okay. So what is that? Well, that's about a 30-minute workout, start to end. 10-minute solid warm-up, 10-minute cool down. And it's, gosh, what's the math? 10, 12 minutes. So it's about 32 minutes, right? To modify that, again, you can change speeds and begin with your own easy walking speed. You can keep it all walking. You can use hills instead of speed. You can use almost any apparatus. So you can use a bike, elliptical, you could swim. You could be upright in the pool doing your intervals. So it's totally up to you, but modifiable. And you've got you've got the outline right there. So check it out. Let's talk interval training, a.k.a. metabolic conditioning. So you'll you'll read those words, and sometimes people will write metcon, which is short for metabolic conditioning. Metabolic conditioning just gives you a little bit more opportunity to do something similar in terms of taxing the body, in terms of internal training the way it does, but it's different using an ex- exercise system that is unique, not the super high high. It's a different moderate intensity interval, and generally it's simply longer. You can sustain that for a longer period of time, and it's good to do that. So if you're thinking, I didn't get truly breathless during some of those moderate intensity intervals, you won't, and and you'll still be able to sustain it, but you're out of that, I want to do this all day. You're not in that steady state where doing that too long increases your cortisol level. Not all metabolic conditioning training has to be high intensity. That's the takeaway here. Using a combination of high intensity interval training, some steady state, 
low intensity interval training, variable intensity training, and variable intensity interval training to work intervals between different levels of intensity and time durations can help ensure you're not using any one energy system more than another when you exercise. Current exercise programming has two inherent problems. Number one, some movements are performed too frequently or with too much intensity. And number two, movements are performed too infrequently or with too little intensity. And you've got to really ask yourself, which am I doing? So if you have adapted or latched on to high intensity interval training must be the ticket. So I'm going to burn belly fat. You may be doing it too often, too much and breaking down. If you're frequently injured, frequently sick, that's probably you. If you're doing too little exercise or the exercise you're doing, it's just with too little intensity. You never actually get breathless. That's also a problem. Where do you fall? Common injuries like tendonitis, impingement syndrome that restrict joint movement or motion are more likely to happen as a result of doing the same exercise too often. And that honestly can be either one of those issues too infrequently and too little intensity or too frequently and too great intensity. Because chronic repetitive stresses that you've had there often is just stressed more when you're starting an exercise program. Don't shoot the messenger. The exercise start that you had may simply have been the wake up call you needed to start taking care of it. Let's talk about that question of safety. So in his book, Pete McCall, I and a few other voices have been saying for a decade, not only is high intensity interval training and strength training with heavy weights or power safe. It is necessary to mitigate the effects of aging and any loss of muscle and bone that has occurred due to menopause. And I might add the pandemic. Lady, you have never needed intense exercise more in your life than you do right now. And you will until you are not waking up in the morning. If you're not exercising, start. But don't just start your mama's exercise. And well, to be honest, this is totally dependent on your birth order. <laughs> Maybe if you're the oldest and you had a very young mama, it might be different for you. But my mom is 95 and any exercise she did only happened later in her life. And it didn't wasn't very consistent. She enjoyed walking with friends, but Generally, they called her, <laughs> but it didn't become a regular habit. She and I began walking while I was still home before college. I clearly have kept it up. up. I kept going. She did not. For her young adulthood, when she was at that very impressionable age, when your habits truly begin, there was no need for exercise. There were chores. She lived on a farm. Life was active then. Regular exercise at low provides numerous health benefits. There's no argument with that. There is, however, a limit to what it can do. For optimal mitochondria, ATP, and strength and efficiency in activities of daily living and the avoidance of muscle loss, bone loss, fat increase, and the combinations of all of the above, the use of strength to muscular fatigue the addition of power when you're ready, and that's adding a speed component. Heavy weights is the most powerful non-pharmaceutical tool available to you to support your aging. You may recall a recent post, if you're following me on social media, that I shared a scientific study where the researchers were quoted. This is an opinion. This is now science, strength training to muscular fatigue and use of the addition of power. Heavy weights is the most powerful non-pharmaceutical tool available to you for optimizing your aging. 
if you're not lifting weights, you're choosing to age older, fatter, and sicker. It's blunt, but it's truthful. So there you have it. Just a recap on the importance of intensity. Talked a lot about variable intensities, a variation of low and moderate and high intensity, how to play with them literally and make your exercise fun and a game again. And you don't necessarily need to be doing drills and skills. If you love a certain activity, look at what you've been doing and is it already there? Maybe you're already doing short and long or moderate duration intervals. Maybe you're already doing low and moderate and high intensity during those intervals. But if you're not, start checking it. You want to work all three of those, both in terms of duration and in terms of intensity. And then don't forget, strength training can also be very intense. You are pushing your cardiovascular system for a minute, maybe less, maybe slightly more when you're doing a strength training exercise. But here's my suggestion based on also research and based on the results for most women, separate your cardio intensity intervals from your strength training. Don't try to mesh it up. Do a, for instance, do a strength training exercise and then do high intensity interval training and back to strength training and back to cardio. Mixing it up like that mixes up the value. You're not changing your body long term. You're still really just getting a hit, a quick fix like cocaine. You're going to need another one because you haven't stimulated your metabolism permanently only within that session. So you want to reach muscular fatigue and you want to boost the metabolism the most from that strength training, which happens and occurs in the 24 and even up to 72 hours after the exercise happens. And that only happens with strength training. With high intensity interval training, you get a little lift and it does stay up for hours, but is a lot shorter and it's not as high as the payback that occurs after strength training. So there you have it. I mentioned earlier, I will share in the show notes that you will find at flipping50.com forward slash menopause exercise intensity. You will find the link to the stronger program. If it's not open right now, and by the way, if you're listening in September, it is open until the very end of the month, but there will be a notifications list you can get on if in case it's closed. There's also a link to the Flipping 50 Fitness Specialist and Advanced Specialist. So you can check out which of those works for you or reach out for me, direct message me, talk to me if you're a fitness professional who wants to get started in September or October. It's an exciting time, but now you're laying your foundation for a strong 2022. And I'll also put the link for P. McCall's book, Ageless Intensity. It's a fantastic book to add to your arsenal. And it's a great one to share. Obviously written by a man for both genders, but your guys may also find some benefit from that. Love to hear from you. I love to hear that these are valuable, that they've offered some kind of insight, some kind of inspiration, some kind of science that is, oh, I needed to hear that today. So anyway, you reach out, show comments in iTunes or from the post where you see this as I share it. Thanks so much. And what are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 together.